Hey everyone, today we're going to be starting chapter five, which is continuing in our saga of proteins. Again, we started with looking at the very basic building blocks of proteins, which was the amino acids and the structure, the 2D structure of a protein with the amino acids. And then we moved into the 3D structure and some of the different types of motifs that can occur in protein folding. Um, we looked at the secondary structure, we looked at tertiary structure, and we looked at quaternary structure in proteins, and that was in chapter four. And now we're gonna be talking about the function of proteins. So we're moving more into things like binding and how proteins actually act with other components. So in this chapter, we're mostly going to be focusing on the idea of binding. So how a protein binds what we call a ligand. And we're going to be exploring a graphical model that is used highly when talking about protein binding. So um, we'll be discussing what this model means, how you can get information from it or how you could plot one of these models yourself. And then we're gonna be talking about protein cooperativity, which also is um, related to binding and function with ligands. This particular chapter has a lot of case studies and these case studies are all important because they are an example of some of these functions that we'll be learning about. Um, so we'll be talking about different proteins, but in the context of the actual protein function idea. So we'll be looking at things like hemoglobin and myoglobin, um, antibodies and how they act, and also muscles and muscle contraction. So these are all very specific case studies that I still want you to understand um, how that unit or that protein works. Um, but remember that they're kind of a reflection, an overall reflection of general protein function. So we're mostly going to be talking about globular proteins. Remember from chapter four, we talked about um, fibrous versus globular proteins. And in globular proteins, the reversible binding of a ligand is essential. So proteins have specific areas um, there's for ligands and these are called binding sites. And the ligand itself is what we call the unit, the chemical, the molecule that is binding to a protein. Ligand binding often causes conformational changes. Um, and in fact, sometimes quite dramatically. We'll be talking about this more, this is called induced fit. Um, and then sometimes if a protein has multiple subunits, those conformational changes can affect another subunit. Uh, and this is called cooperativity. And again, we'll be going into this further into this chapter. We'll also be talking about how interactions between ligands and binding sites can be regulated. And again, this is going to be illustrated by uh, case studies where we'll be talking about specific proteins, so hemoglobin, antibodies, muscle proteins. Some of the functions of globular proteins include things like storage of ions or molecules. The good example of this is something like myoglobin, which just acts to store oxygen. It's just a storage molecule. Or ferritin, ferritin acts to store iron. Proteins can also act as transport molecules. So they can move ions or molecules around a system. Hemoglobin is an example of this. It moves oxygen. So it's not oxygen storage, it's oxygen transport. Um, serotonin transporters, for example, are going to be proteins that move, that transport serotonin to different areas of the brain. 
Proteins can also act against, um, in a defensive way against pathogens. Um, they help protect a biological system. One of the most obvious examples of this is antibodies. And I'm, I'm sure everyone's hearing a lot about antibodies and antibody production um, in response to COVID. Antibodies are a type of protein and they're a very special type of protein that helps protect a system. They help defend a system. Um, another example of this is a type of protein called a cytokine. Proteins, of course, have lots of other different functions in relation to biological systems, including things like muscle contraction. So actin and myosin, which we'll be looking at as examples, are types of proteins that help in movement um, and at a more global level of the actual biological um, system in, in humans or animals or whatever it is you're looking at that has the muscles, they act uh, in a whole way to move that particular biological system. And of course, one of the most recognized examples of enzymes or of proteins, excuse me, is their ability to act as a catalyst. Um, and we specifically will call these types of proteins enzymes. These are proteins that help to make a reaction occur faster. Remember a catalyst does not actually participate in the reaction, but it helps facilitate the reaction's progress. Um, we have tons and tons and tons and tons of proteins that act as enzymes and they act in this way to chemically help a biological system quicken the pace of a reaction. So things like chymotrypsin, lysozyme, these are all going to be proteins that are acting to, um, again, quicken or catalyze a reaction. So here we're gonna be, again, talking a lot about how um, proteins interact with other molecules. And again, this is what we call um, binding. And we usually call the area, the chemical that is interacting with the protein, the ligand. So that could be any type of molecule. It's just, we define it as a ligand. Ligand is the thing that is binding to the protein. And you can describe this type of interaction through a normal chemical reaction, chemical equilibrium equation. So here we're talking about some molecule A binding with some molecule B. So this could be protein and ligand to then combine into one full molecule. Again, the molecule that binds the protein we call the ligand and it is typically small. Not always, sometimes a ligand can be another peptide or another protein. Again, it can be any type of molecule. Don't just think that it has to be, you know, a small molecule like ethanol or um, methane or something like that. It can be any type of other molecule that is interacting with a protein. And the region that this occurs along the protein we call the binding site. So these are areas on a protein in which some ligand can interact and bind. These types of interactions uh, are most always non-covalent. So remember what that means. That means there's no actual sharing covalent bond that occurs between a ligand and a protein. Non-covalent types of bonds we've already discussed in the past. Non-covalent types of bonds and interactions are what also help fold a protein itself. Remember, we talked about ionic bonding. We talked about hydrogen bonding. Um, we talked about um, cysteines forming a bridge, right? We talked about um, hydrophobic interactions and effects that occur. So these are all types of non-covalent interactions that 
like I just said, also help to fold the protein, but these are the same types of interactions that will allow um, for the binding of a ligand to a binding site on a protein. The reason that we want to use non-covalent interactions as opposed to covalent interactions. Non-covalent interactions are not as strong. Covalent interactions, covalent bonds hold molecules together. They hold atoms. They are the bonds that make up a molecule. But we want this interaction to be transient. We want to be able to add and remove a ligand. The ligand isn't going to want to permanently bind to a binding site. We need the potential as a biological organism to go in between being bound and unbound. A lot of these reactions need to be reversible, right? You don't always want to have a molecule stuck in your protein that doesn't leave room for example, a new molecule to bind. So because we want these interactions to be transient, to be reversible, non-covalent interactions are the best type of interaction to utilize. So to describe this process uh, even more, again, we can use an equilibrium type of uh, equation. So if you consider the process, as I just explained, where a ligand binds reversibly to a protein, this is going to be a very common just sample diagram of what we're seeing. Some protein with a binding site and some ligand, some other molecule. They can bind together to make what we're now defining as one molecule, this PL, through a non-covalent bond. And that is reversible, meaning it can go backwards and it can go forwards. The interaction can be described by essentially what is an equilibrium constant, but we call this the association rate constant or Ka. Ka is the rate at which these associate, they come together. If you think about it in the reverse, it's called the dissociation rate constant, meaning the rate in which they come apart. And of course, at some time, this process reaches equilibrium and the association and the dissociation rates are equal, right? Equilibrium composition is characterized by the equilibrium association constant, the Ka, or dissociation constant. So remember in our equilibrium equations, if you were to write a Keq, it's very simply written usually as the concentration of the product over the concentration of the starting material. So starting over product, or excuse me, product over starting. In this case, we're writing the exact same type of equation you can see we can say that the association constant, this is just the essentially equilibrium uh, equation for association of proteins, is the concentration of the product, which is the protein and the ligand combined. We're just, we're just um, describing that as PL over the concentration of the starting materials, which is the protein by itself and the ligand by itself. So again, we define this as Ka. This is the association constant. And again, it is just a special equilibrium constant to describe the association of a protein and a ligand. This also can be written as the dissociation constant, which remember is the reverse. So when we write it as the dissociation constant, it's one over KD, which would be the reverse dissociation constant. So again, you can write this as either Ka equals the products over the reactants or 
the one over KD, the dissociation constant equals products over reactants. Now, this is very helpful to have an equation to describe the dissociation rate or the association rate of a ligand in the protein. But in practice, it's very hard to determine how much actual combined protein there is and how much of each of these pieces there are. It's very, it's very hard to just take a sample and look at it and count, oh, there are three of these and there are two of these and there's one of these, right? We can't usually just look at a solution and know exactly how much is of each of the chemicals is present. So in practice, it's actually easier to determine the fraction of the protein that is bound up or the fraction of occupied binding sites. We use this theta to describe that. So the fraction of occupied, of occupied protein just simply means how much protein is bound compared to essentially protein that is not bound. So you have a sample, you have some protein that is unbound floating around. This is my empty circles and you have some protein that is bound. Okay, so in this sample here, the fraction of the protein that is occupied that is bound is two out of one, two, three, four, five, six, which we can also write as one third. So what I did here, of course, is I took the amount of protein that is bound divided by the total amount that is there. So that's the bound and the unbound. That's all that this equation is saying up here. Very simply, it's just saying what fraction of the protein is bound compared to the total amount that is around. Now, this is much easier to measure this fraction of how much is bound to unbound or to the total. And essentially using some rearranging, we can write the equilibrium constant we just talked about, which is that dissociation constant in relation to this fraction of occupied binding sites. So, this is very measurable, fraction of occupied binding sites. And if we want to find the equilibrium constant, we can rewrite this equation to set it to theta, the fraction of um, bound to total protein. And that's this equation, which is showing that the fraction of the occupied binding sites, the fraction of the bound protein to total protein is equal to the concentration of just the ligand. So just the, the molecule that is the piece binding divided by the ligand plus the dissociation constant. So again, all this is really telling you um, not to be confused. The main point I want to get across is that the fraction of bound sites, that is how much of the protein actually is filled and bound is dependent on two things. And that is how much of the ligand is around so you can imagine if I put a ton of ligand in, if I put a ton of this piece in, it's more likely that I'll start getting more bound protein. There's just, there's so much ligand around that it's, it's just uh, going to be very likely that the protein will at least bind some of it. So again, the amount of it that is bound is dependent number one on the concentration of the ligand that is present. 
And the second thing it's dependent on, on is this KD, this equilibrium constant. And this KD is just describing how well that particular protein is at binding a ligand. So again, KD just is a description of how good of a binder a protein is. This is why we're interested in finding the dissociation constant or the association constant Ka. Remember, these are related because they give us information. They tell us how good a protein is at tightly binding a ligand. So again, what we found out, these three things are related to each other. The fraction of protein that is bound in any sample is related to how much ligand is in the sample and how good of a binder that protein is, the dissociation constant, KD. So these three things. Now, experimentally, the way that we find out information about these three things about the fraction of protein that is bound, about the concentration of ligand, and namely how we find out the dissociation constant, the KD, is through the Hill equation. This is a graphical analysis, and normally we're using it to solve for the KD. We're, we're using it to solve for how good of a binder that particular protein is with whatever ligand we're looking at. So how good that protein is at binding a particular ligand. So the way that you determine this dissociation constant, this KD, is by plotting the fraction of bound enzyme. Now here it's written as Y, but in our past slide it was as theta. So this is also the theta. Fraction of bound enzyme versus concentration of ligand. Now normally in an experiment, you can control the concentration of ligand. You have some protein, you've isolated the protein maybe, and you're just adding in a molecule that you suspect it could bind to. So for example, let's say you have a protein that might be related to pain modulation and you wanna see how well aspirin binds to it. So you take your protein, you have it isolated and you're just gonna add in aspirin. So you're adding the ligand in and at different concentrations. So here we're looking at concentrations of the ligand. You'll measure the fraction of bound enzyme. And you plot that, you make a plot, the fraction of bound enzyme to how much of the ligand you put in. To calculate the KD, the KD will be at the point where half of the enzyme, the present enzyme is bound. This is that equilibrium point. So this is the KD. So the point at which half of the enzyme is bound, you look down to where that concentration of ligand you needed is, and that is your KD. So this point shows you the KD, it is a concentration, would be about maybe one. Right, so look along our axis, this is five, this is 10. I'm just making a guess here. This KD, if we trace it back to the point where we have half bound enzyme is about one. So again, the KD is telling you the concentration at which half of your enzyme is bound. It's a relative measure of how strong a protein binds. So I've drawn a line on here, this red line, and this is a different plot, this red line here. And notice I've also traced a line, a, a dotted line from the halfway point 
So this is when half of the enzyme is bound. And if I go down, you can see it's at a much higher concentration. It's probably at like 4.5 instead of this KD, which is at about one. So this tells me that the black line protein, it can bind up half of the protein available. It will be bound at a much lower concentration of ligand. That means it's a strong binder. Whereas the red line shows me that it takes more ligand around. I have to dump in more ligand to finally get half of that protein bound up. And that's at a concentration of 4.5. So that's how this graph can tell you, number one, the dissociation constant. And also it gives you an idea of how strong of a binder that particular protein is. So this Hill equation we'll be using throughout this whole chapter, be familiar with how to analyze a Hill equation plot like this and how to build one if you had to build one given values, how you would put it together. So here's an example of a Hill equation and a real protein, which is myoglobin. Myoglobin, as I said previously, is a transport protein. It transports oxygen. So in this case, oxygen is its ligand. Now something here, not to be confused, when we talk about a ligand that is a gas, we describe its concentration as a pressure. It's much harder to measure the concentration of oxygen in a room. And instead we use pressure as a measure of the concentration. Because concentration and pressure are related for a gas, they are interchangeable. So this equation can be rewritten and you will see it rewritten sometimes where the pressure of oxygen, notice takes the place of concentration of ligand. And again here, pressure of oxygen is concentration of ligand. And the KD, the dissociation constant, Remember, this is the point at which half of our particular protein is bound up. This is the concentration at which half of it is bound. So we can rewrite that it as the pressure at which half of the enzyme is bound. So again, we're just taking all of the concentration units and we're writing them as pressure units. So don't be confused if you see this pressure being thrown about. Again, when we're talking about a gas, we just write anything that we would be talking about in concentration as pressure. So for myoglobin, here's its plot. You can see that right here is the point at which half of the myoglobin proteins are bound with oxygen. And if we go down to the bottom, here is our P50 or our KD, right? The dissociation constant. This is the pressure, the actual pressure at which half of the myoglobin protein is bound with oxygen. And you can see it is very, very low. In fact, I think it is about 0.2, yes, 0.2, Six, I had to check that. This is 0 0.26. And this is in kilopascals, so that, that's just a pressure um, unit. 0 0.26 compared to over here, we have five and 10. So that means that myoglobin binds oxygen very strongly, right? We only need a very, very small pressure of oxygen around and already half of the myoglobin has bound up that oxygen. So it is a strong binder. And again, that is what this Hill equation is showing you. Now, again, I want to clarify on these constants. Uh, I've been talking about concentrations and pressures. So the 
Dissociation constant, which we have been looking at on the plot, is a unit of concentration, right? These plots all have concentration of ligand here, that's concentration. And the actual KD is also a, a concentration because it's the concentration where half of the enzyme fraction is bound. So KD is a concentration unit, and that's why we use it very often. It's very easy to report things in terms of concentration. Now remember that Ka and Kd are related to each other. Ka equals one over Kd. So if Kd is a concentration, that means that Ka equals one over molarity or the concentration. So you can also write your uh, answers in terms of Ka. If you're asked for Ka, it's just one over whatever the Kd is. That's the unit of Ka. Now we can also talk about interactions between molecule binding using free energy terms, which is our kilojoules per mole unit. <clears throat> the, re the way that free energy is related to Kd is the same way that any equilibrium constant is related to free energy. And we've actually um, discussed this in, I believe, chapter one, where we showed this relationship between free energy and equilibrium constant. So here, free energy is equal to negative RT natural log of the association constant, or you can write this as no negative symbol, just RT natural log of the dissociation constant. So here you can see that the dissociation constant number is going to be directly related to the actual free energy of that binding reaction. So you can figure out if um, how, based on how strong of a bind something has, how um, weak or strong its KD is, its um, association or dissociation constant is, you can relate that to if something is a spontaneous or non-spontaneous reaction by calculating its um, free energy, its interaction binding. Now, to get an idea of what we describe as something strong or weak, general, generally, if something has a dissociation constant that is less than 10 nanomolar, so strong, or strong binding means a small dissociation constant. Remember, this is a dissociation constant. You don't want it to dissociate. So if it's very small, just like on our plot here, if it's very small, right, very small amount, that means it takes a small amount of ligand to get halfway, half of that protein bound, that is a strong binding. So when KD is stronger than 10 nanomolar, we usually say it's strong binding. If KD is greater than 10 micromolar, we call that a weak bind. So that means it takes a lot of ligand to get it to actually bind to the protein. To see some examples of binding strength, here's a nice plot of KD at the bottom. Here, this is very small numbers, right? Small KD is strong binding. And this is very large numbers. Large KD is weak binding. And here are some typical types of interactions we see. Um, you can see antibodies bind to their antigens pretty strongly. Um, proteins that have to bind DNA also usually bind pretty strongly. Now, enzymes, catalytic enzymes, bind to their substrates sometimes kind of weakly. And sometimes we want that lower affinity so that you can bind, do your catalysis, but then open up a position to have a new substrate, a new ligand bind to be catalyzed. So that's why these are maybe a little bit more low affinity in their bond, binding strength. 
things that are very important to have a strong bond on like an antibody or to have something recognizing DNA, you want that to be very strong. These are gonna have a very low KD. Now let's talk a little bit more about where the specificity comes from. Proteins typically have a pretty high specificity, um, meaning that only certain ligands will bind to them. So high specificity is explained through the ability of a binding site to be complementary to the ligand. What that means is the size or the shape or the charge or the hydrophobic or hydrophilic character of the actual binding site on a protein will be a perfect complement to the ligand. So for example, the binding site might perfectly be the same shape as the ligand as shown in this cartoon here and the same size as the ligand again as shown in this cartoon. It could also have this it could also have complementary charges. So the binding site might have a lot of amino acids that have positive charges. And that's because the ligand that it wants to bind has a lot of negative charge on it. So that will be complementary as well or the binding site might be very hydrophobic. And that's because the ligand itself is also very hydrophobic, so they will go together. This is called the lock and key model. And it again assumes that complementary surfaces are essentially preformed, meaning that proteins, when they are folding themselves, these binding sites just are formed and ready to be um, able to accept a ligand. They're ready, they're complementary, they're the perfect size, shape, charge, et cetera, to fit the ligand that they need to fit. And this is true for a lot of proteins. A lot of proteins have binding pockets that are formed once they are made, once they are folded, and they are the perfect shape for their particular ligand so that they're very specific for that ligand. But sometimes conformational changes can occur when a ligand binds and this is called induced fit. So as opposed to this lock and key idea where you just have your complementary sites kind of already pre-established and they just fit with each other because they fit well together. Um, it was found that some proteins actually can adapt their fit. They can adapt their shape or their charge or their size to allow for a tighter bind to the ligand. So here we have an example. This is some binding site of a protein and here is your ligand. And you can see that there's not very high specificity to start with. But let's say that these two start to interact, they start to bind. The particular protein, when it binds the enzyme, might actually be able to change its structure to better fit the ligand. And this can actually happen on both ends. The protein can change its shape, it can change its fit, and the ligand can actually maybe rearrange or change itself once bind. So sometimes the act of binding to each other will cause the shape to change and it'll actually change it for a tighter bond. And again, this is called induced fit. 